So, well, my name is my name is Jerry Marcotus, and it's been a, it's been a pleasure working with so many people around the triangle on issue after issue, and here's one that just brings so many things together. I mean, with uh, with nuclear war kind of with leaders dancing on the precipice of nuclear war, there's nothing that's that could, that would go untouched. I mean, this is just beyond what I. <laughs> what we usually have to deal with. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank people who have, who have contributed to help make this North Carolina tour possible. Uh, we do have a, a, a Greensboro venue and also at Warren Wilson College and also in Asheville. So uh, things have come together very nicely and you all have made it possible. And I want to say, it's interesting how a project that uh, Medea had helped with years ago that involved the Forest Foundation, um, it, it was a benefit for the Lemoore project over at Duke. And, uh, and so the, the Forest Foundation has, has, has generously helped, um, helped us make this happen. So uh, thanks all of you. <laughs> We've been so lucky to have Ray McGovern come and speak to us over the years, and it's hard to imagine anybody closer to the kind of issue we're talking about tonight than, than Ray. Um, uh, Ray has, uh, uh, well, he has responsibility for his wife, Rita, who has been ailing, and so uh, sometimes she's really ahead of things, and other times she's kind of slipped back, so this was one of those slip back days. But uh, I think things are kind of on a, on a level. And, uh, but he was unable to come tonight. Um, so uh, we will hear from him again. So keep an eye on the, uh, on the emails. Um, there's so many, so many powerful uh, analyses and responsible discussions going on amidst all of the heavy, heavily influenced pro-war basically uh, self-righteous kinds of uh, claims that um, I wanted to especially share, and I made a lot of discs of, of John Mearsheimer's talk, looking at how the major, major powers amorally just collide. And what he has to say, I think is very interesting. I made a lot of CDs and I made some thumb drives with that talk and also a number of videos on it. So y'all feel free uh, to, uh, to pick up material from the table. Um, the, uh, I just noticed recently that while it's the, the, the computers that play a CD are becoming rather rare, every, almost every car has got this sort of, a, it's, it's not a smile, it's, it's, it's this thin lips there. You just slide the, <laughs> slide the disc in, and a lot of our driving is half an hour or so, so, uh, so we really use our CDs that way. But be sure, uh, feel free to share the Mearsheimer uh, piece and other discs that you see. Um, so we're, we're lucky to have with us tonight uh, Will Zhang, who teaches at UNCG, and will be hosting Medea on Tuesday evening. And so uh, uh, Will is going to come forward and, 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 and introduce Medea. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I am standing in for, for Ray McGovern tonight, <clears throat> filling some, some quite big shoes. I'm just going to say a few words about Medea, and then I'm going to get off the stage and, and let her come up and speak. So. Like Jerry said, my name is Will Zhang. I'm the Assistant Director of the International and Global Studies Program at UNC Greensboro. Um, I'm hosting Medea tomorrow, um, but I actually live in the area, so um, I get uh, two for one, so it's, it's pretty good for me. <clears throat> so it's my great pleasure, pleasure tonight, excuse me, to, to introduce our speaker this evening, Medea Benjamin. Uh, Medea has such a long and distinguished career as an author and an activist that I will be forced to leave much out of this intro for the sake of time. Um, many know Medea best as the co-founder of Code Pink, a grassroots woman-led organization working to end U.S. foreign wars and imperialism. 
Um, this organization was founded, as, as you all probably know, in the wake of the 9-11 attacks and the invasion of Afghanistan. She has worked on many of today's most pressing human rights issues, including ending unfair labor practices both here and abroad, organizing to end U.S. interventions in the Middle East and fighting for justice in Palestine. Also a distinguished author, Medea has written 10 books on such very topics as U.S.-Saudi alliance, um, U.S. drone warfare, and Cuban agriculture. Being a tireless and tenacious advocate for social justice, over nearly five decades has clearly not slowed her down. She comes to us this evening to speak on her recently published work, um, co-authored with Norm, excuse me, uh, Nicholas Davies, entitled War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, Medea Benjamin. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and while I was waiting and talking to many of you in the front area, I was just so impressed at how many activists are here on so many different issues. So I don't know uh, exactly how many of you might not be active in things, but for those of you who are doing so much great work on issues like Palestine, and free Julian Assange, and uh, the general work for peace, the Raging Grannies, uh, so many great, great things that you're doing. Thank you for all that work. I just wonder how many of you yourselves or people you know uh, are very confused about this issue. Could you raise your hand? So just about everybody know somebody or has your own kind of conflicting views in your own head, um, this is a tough one. This has been a really, really tough issue to get people to understand. And um, I want to go through tonight some of the myths that I think are holding a lot of people back uh, in their comprehension of where this came from. But first, let me start by saying happy Martin Luther King Day. And uh, this is certainly a day to reflect on Martin Luther King's Beyond Vietnam speech, his anti-war calling, what that cost him, the way that he was reviled when he came out against the Vietnam War, persona non grata in a lot of places, including the White House. Uh, and yet he said that he, it was his moral obligation to speak out against war. And certainly that one quote of his in that speech always sticks with me when we talk about a society that puts more money into the military than into social uplift is moving towards spiritual death. And he said that many decades ago, and unfortunately I think it's still the case, especially when you see the recent budget that was passed of $858 billion for the Pentagon. That's not counting the money for Ukraine. That's not counting the money for nuclear weapons. You put that all together and we're at about a trillion dollars now. A trillion dollars a year. And I have just arrived here today, so I don't know what your community is like, but I just came from Los Angeles where the streets are lined with people that don't have housing. And where the schools are crumbling, where the infrastructure is terrible, where people can't find a good place to go to get decent health care, and where young people are paying absurd amounts of money for what they should get for free. In fact, they should get a stipend to do it, and that's to get a college education. So to think how we have evolved since the time of Martin Luther King, in some ways, of course, we have made progress. But we've not made progress in terms of where we spend our money, where we spend our resources. 
And we haven't made progress in terms of how we deal with conflict. And that's especially true after 9-11, when we've been involved in war after war after war. And I know some people in this room were active trying to stop the US from responding to the 9-11 attacks by, by going to war. And thank you for the Veterans for Peace and others who do so much work on this issue. WILF, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, so many groups. And so many of us that came out into the streets by the hundreds of thousands and said no to the war in Iraq and the government wouldn't listen to us. And here we are 20 years later, and Iraq now has a government that is pro-Iran. Now, I don't say that's good or bad, but I'm just saying, what did 20 years of US involvement do except for kill about a million Iraqis, destroy the lives of millions of people who had to flee their homes, kill so many of our own soldiers, and left Iraq in way worse shape than it was under the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. And then you look at Afghanistan, where I have worked very recently to try to right the wrong of the US not only being there for 20 years and then leaving the country in the hands of the Taliban and stealing the $7 billion that was their bank cash reserve for the whole country, where the US has said, oh, put your money in the US Federal Reserve, that's a safe place for it. And when the US leaves, they leave and take the money, leaving Afghanistan in a catastrophic situation today with millions of people hungry. I was there quite recently visiting poor neighborhoods where you saw people that were drying grass so that they could boil it and feed it to their kids, people eating grass people selling their kidneys to be able to feed their families. We went to one house and we were very concerned about the girls not being able to go to school. And I remember saying to this one mother surrounded by a couple of her children, you know, it's so sad that your girls can't go to school. And she said, our boys can't go to school either. We can't afford the pen the paper, the books that they would need to go to school. And we have to send them out on the street to beg so we will have something to feed the rest of the family. That's the situation we left Afghanistan in after spending trillions of dollars. It really is sickening. And so some of us thought after the very chaotic exit that Biden oversaw leaving Afghanistan, that maybe there would be a peace dividend, <laughs> meaning maybe we, the taxpayers, would get to put our money into something other than a humongous Pentagon. But no, right after that war, now we're into another one. So I said I wanted to talk about some of the myths. And I think it's something that we hear over and over and over again when it comes to Ukraine, is that this is a war that is unjustified and unprovoked. And I want to say very clearly that I think it is totally unjustified, because I think war is unjustified. I don't think that we can say that with all the issues faced by Russia, they had the right to go in and invade a sovereign nation. And the brutality they are inflicting upon the Ukrainian people is tragic. Now they're using the tactic of blowing up the infrastructure, the electricity grids. And if you think you're cold in the winter here, think of what the winter is like in, Afghan in, in Ukraine. And think of what it's like when you don't have heating, when you don't have electricity. It is really tragic what is happening in Ukraine, but it has been provoked. 
And that is something that the American people don't understand because either it isn't brought up or it's just poo-pooed. Oh yes, the expansion of NATO, that really wasn't very important. You know what? It set the stage for this invasion. And there were so many warnings about it. In our book, we go page after page giving examples of the warnings from foreign policy experts who said this is a tragic mistake and it will cause instability in the region. From US officials who said it's a tragic mistake, it will cause instability in the region. From former ambassadors who said you find throughout Russia absolute opposition to the expansion of NATO. And so what did the US government do, whether it was a democratic administration of Bill Clinton or whether it was a Republican administration of George Bush? Expand, expand, expand. And that is a provocation. Just think, if Mexico decided they wanted to go into an alliance with China or with Russia, would the U.S. ever allow that? A military alliance? Would they ever allow that? Absolutely not. In fact, we're at the 200th anniversary this year of the Monroe Doctrine that said not only Mexico, but all of Latin America was our backyard and we would not allow another power to come in and challenge us there. So here you have the expansion of NATO right up to the border of Russia. And you have U.S. involvement directly in Ukrainian affairs. Now we often hear about Russia's involvement in U.S. affairs, Russiagate, and how Hillary Clinton only lost the election because of Russiagate. That's how Trump won. There was recently a very academic study that was done looking at the effects of the Russian trolls and said it had no impact. But the U.S. certainly had an impact when it came to its intervention in Ukrainian affairs. And again, we go in our book into great detail. We talk about the National Endowment for Democracy and all the tax money that was poured into building pro-Western groups, anti-Russian groups. And then there was the Maidan uprising in 2014, which was a popular uprising against a democratically elected government, but a corrupt government. And people came out peacefully, large numbers of people, to protest that government. But it was hijacked. It was hijacked by right-wing paramilitary elements, and it was right, uh, hijacked by U.S. government officials. Now, we don't know the extent of U.S. government involvement because these are things that we find out after the facts when there are more freedom of information requests that come out. But we have a leaked telephone call between the Assistant Secretary of State, Victoria Newland when she was talking to the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine when they were deciding who would be the ones that would be in charge of the government that would be overthrown. Literally saying who they wanted in power, who they wanted to sideline and keep on the outside. That was the famous quote in which they said, screw the EU, the European Union, we're gonna be the ones to decide. And then you have Victoria Newland that goes out into the streets of well, during the Maidan uprising, giving out sandwiches and, and cookies. Now, what if on January 26, when there was an uprising in our capital in Washington, D.C., somebody from the Russian embassy came out and said, here are some sweets. Go and overthrow your government. We are with you. <laughs> Well, it wouldn't have happened because all hell would have broken loose if it did. But that's what the U.S. was doing. So provocation, provocation. 
And after the Maidan uprising and after it ended in a coup, and there was then a pro-Western government that was put into power, the pro-Russian part of the Donbas rebelled, broke away, and the Russians came in to take back Crimea, which had been given to Ukraine by Khrushchev. And the fighting started in the Donbass. So the fighting didn't just start on February 24th when the Russians invaded. The fighting has been going on for years now, since 2014. And the US got very involved with the civil war that was going on in the Donbass by training Ukrainian soldiers and by sending weapons. Now there was an agreement that was negotiated one year later in 2015 called the Minsk Agreements that was supposed to end the conflict. But what happened? The political part of the agreement was never fulfilled by the Ukrainian government. They were supposed to go talk to the leaders of the breakaway republic. They were supposed to then give autonomy to the region within the framework of being part of Ukraine. And that never happened. Zelensky, who campaigned as a pro-peace president and got overwhelming support for that stand, when he came into power and said he was going to go meet with the heads of the breakaway regions, was threatened with his life. He was told he would be hanging from a tree. And so the Minsk agreement was never implemented. Now, very recently, in the last couple of weeks, there were some quite remarkable revelations that we heard from the former chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, and from the former head of France, Francois Hollande. And both of them said that that Minsk agreement, which we all thought was supposed to end the conflict, was really meant to buy time for the Ukrainians to build up their military, for the West to send in the weapons, for them to be able to attack the Donbass and perhaps even be ready for a war with Russia. And so Russia learned just recently that they had been duped with that agreement, that it had never intended to be implemented. But here we have the conflict going on, the Russians deciding to invade on February 24th. I would say a terrible mistake that they did. Perhaps they had really bad intelligence, like the US often gets really bad intelligence. Perhaps they thought they could easily go in and overthrow the government in Kiev and put a pro-Russian government in place. That obviously did not happen. But we also see that the US and the West was ready to take on this fight. And that the US said that this was a fight between democracy and dictatorship. That we would have to get involved in this because this we have to defend democracies. Now many of you who came who work here on the issue of Israel-Palestine know that the U.S. is oftentimes not on the side of democracies. In fact, in the case of Israel, we give them, what, about $4 billion every year to repress the Palestinian people. Egypt, we give about $2 billion a year to a repressive government that has about 60,000 political prisoners. We sell weapons to one of the most repressive regimes in the world, and that is Saudi Arabia. But the US said, we have to get into this fight to defend democracy. And so we see this pouring in of weapons and weapons and training and weapons. And so here we are at a situation where we are being told 
that the way to victory in Ukraine is to send in more and more weapons. We are told that victory is around the corner and all we have to do is give another 40 billion, another 30 billion, what was the latest, another 47 billion. Uh, and the narrative that we're hearing in the press is this narrative that there is a possibility of victory. Now, what does victory mean? The way they're hearing, we're hearing in the press, it is that Ukraine will be able to take back every inch of territory that is controlled by Russia or pro-Russian forces, meaning all of the Donbas and all of Crimea, basically going back to 2014. But guess what? The military generals who know a losing war when they see it, <laughs> the ones in the United States, they are saying victory on the battlefield is really not possible. You're hearing that from the number one military advisor to the president, and that is the chair of the Joint Chief of Staff, Mark Milley, who said the Ukrainians have done a, uh, a courageous uh, battle. They have won what they are going to win on the battlefield. Now is the time to seize the moment and go for negotiations. And it's not just what we're hearing or what they're saying inside the Pentagon. It's also what people are saying, what we're hearing from former generals in Europe as well. Very pessimistic that if this goes on and on, it could, as the head of NATO, Jen Stoltenberg, a real war hawk, he said, his fear is that this will spin out of control. And if it goes wrong, he said, it can go horribly wrong. Horribly wrong means not just the Ukrainians will keep getting killed, it means that it will go and spin out into another country, a NATO country, like Poland, right. which will mean Article 5 of NATO will be invoked, which means that we will have to get involved physically, militarily, and confront Russia directly. Spinning out of control horribly could also mean that Putin feels that he is pushed into a corner and would use a nuclear weapon. Now, it's so interesting that people who want us to keep pumping more weapons into Ukraine said, oh, Putin will never use a nuclear weapon, but they say he's a crazy man. Well, if he's a crazy man, maybe he would use a nuclear weapon. And so there are certainly people in the military who are very concerned about this possibility. And remember in 1962 when J.F. Kennedy was negotiating with Khrushchev because they knew they held the world in their hand and the possibility of a nuclear war was very real. They negotiated, they compromised. Russia took its nuclear weapons out of Cuba and the U.S. removed its missiles from Turkey. And JFK said, Never, if you were in a confrontation with a nuclear power, never put them in a position of either a humiliating defeat or the use of a nuclear weapon. <clears throat> Is that where we are pushing Putin? So the people inside the military are really starting to question where is this going? But we're not hearing that from our government officials. We're not hearing that from President Biden. We're not hearing President Biden said, oh, I think I better start talking to Putin. He hasn't talked to Putin in this entire time. It's going on a year. You're not hearing the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, say, oh, I think we better start talking to my counterpart, Lavrov, in Russia. No. What you're seeing only is that the head of the CIA, William Burns, by the way, he was in, my, in, in Russia during the time of the early 
NATO expansion and talked about what a disaster it was back then. He has met with his counterpart. Jake Sullivan, National Security Council, has met with his counterpart. And so has Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense. They are meeting not to come up with a peace plan, but they are meeting to see how they can stop this from spinning out of control. But we need the civilians in our government. We need the Secretary of State and we need the President to get on board to push for negotiations. And you know how they say the excuse, nothing for Ukraine without Ukraine, we can't convince the Ukrainians to go for negotiations. Well, guess what? If you said there was no longer a blank check, the Ukrainians would have to negotiate. So, there also have been attempts at negotiations. There was a very good attempt at negotiations right a month after the Russian invasion, when Erdogan in Turkey was mediating, and you had both sides that came up with a 15-point peace plan. And the peace plan included that Ukraine would be a neutral state, that it recognized that it would not be able to join NATO, but that its neutrality and its sovereignty would be guaranteed by strong states. Russian troops would leave. There would be a negotiated process for the Donbass so there could be internationally monitored elections there so the people there could decide for themselves how they wanted to be affiliated. And they talked about the issue of Crimea being bumped down the road. They would deal with that in the coming years. It could be as long as 15 years away. A very positive peace process that was in the works until Boris Johnson, the head of the UK at that time, came and said, the collective West does not want to see you negotiate a deal with Russia. We are in this with you for victory. And then Lloyd Austin also came from the US and said that we must weaken Russia. And so you saw the peace talks were cut off. There have been talks though on small things. And I think it's important to mention that because what I hear a lot is people say, you can't talk to Putin. You can't talk to Russia. Well, let's recognize not only were those talks happening before they were sabotaged, but the Ukrainians and the Russians have also talked about some very serious things and successfully. For example, you remember a couple of months ago when it looked like the largest nuclear power plant in all of Europe, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant was gonna be blown up, that there were uh, shelling coming from both sides and they sat down and they negotiated and they agreed that the International Atomic Energy Association would come in and calm the situation down. There have also been successful negotiations about the grain trade because who knew before this happened that Ukraine and Russia were responsible for so much of the exports of grain around the world. And it was so important to get this grain out to countries in Africa and the Middle East who were so desperately in need of that grain. And so they negotiated a land corridor and a sea corridor to get over 10 million tons of grain out of Ukraine and to get more fertilizers out from Russia because they were on the sanction list and then got lifted from the sanction list. Happened through negotiations. And a third area of negotiations that is ongoing is prisoner swaps. Now we heard about the prisoner swap with uh, Brittany Griner and that was between the US and Russia but there have been prisoner swaps going on constantly between Ukraine and Russia. We don't hear about them very often, if at all, but there have been probably about two dozen prisoner swaps. The last one I heard was on January 8th. And imagine all the work that goes into one prisoner swap, and some of them are hundreds of prisoners in negotiating who's gonna get traded for who, how it's gonna happen, the trust that's built up that each side is gonna do what they say. So there have been negotiations on some of these issues. 
What we need to get, of course, is negotiations on how to stop this war. And that's where we come in. Because in our Congress, we are certainly not getting even the discussion about that. I live most of my time in Washington, D.C., and it is just mind-blowing to see what is happening in Washington, D.C. That when that $40 billion package to Ukraine was voted on, in which almost half of it was for military, there wasn't a discussion on the House floor about that. There wasn't a hearing about it. And there wasn't one Democrat that voted against it. Not one. Not a member of the squad, not Barbara Lee, who was the one who voted against war after 9-11. None of them. A Democratic president, and they all voted for that package. There were 57 Republicans in the House that voted against it. There were 11 senators who voted against it. But that's a small handful as well. And some of them because they thought the enemy is China. And that's where we should be putting our sights. And others said it should be going to the border to militarize our border, to make us safe from the hordes trying to come in. But very little discussion about Ukraine itself. And then I don't know if you followed what happened when afterwards, months, months later, there was a letter initiated by the head of the Progressive Caucus, Pramila, Pramila Jayapal, that was saying, yes, we were giving the weapons and that was good and what Biden is doing is good, but on top of all that, it would be good to start some negotiations. A very, very, very mild letter. Well, a letter usually is out there for a week or two, and then that's the end. It's whoever signs it, signed it, and it's given in. Well, they had such a hard time getting Democrats to sign that letter. There are 100 members of the Progressive Caucus. They, they could not get four-fifths of that caucus to sign that letter. So they kept extending it and extending it. There were five people, there were 10 people. Finally, months later, they put it out with 30 members who had signed. And all hell broke loose. People started saying, wait, did I really sign that? Well, I don't remember having signed that. We'll take my name off that. And Nancy Pelosi coming down on them like a ton of bricks and saying, what are you doing? There's elections coming up. And the President Biden is the one who sets those policies. Why are you trying to second guess? Within 24 hours, I've never seen anything like this in my life. A letter that was signed, sealed, and delivered to President Biden was withdrawn. And there was only one person out of those 30 who didn't go back on it. Only one person who came out publicly and said, of course, that was a rational thing to call for negotiations. And that was Rokana from California. So the only one in the Democratic Party now who's publicly saying that negotiations would be a good thing. It is very, very strange when you see somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene in the Republican Party having one of the most rational voices when it comes to Ukraine. <laughs> you have to say, what is going on in our country? And one thing that is going on is when it's a Democrat in the White House, you get very, very little uh, blowback, and you get very little uh, response because the Republicans are mostly war hawks all the time. And the Democrats, you know, sometimes I think if it were Trump in the White House, we would have some Democrats with us. But you also have to look at what the media is doing. And I have never seen a campaign like this. I mean, we've seen campaigns to sell the war in Iraq. We've seen campaigns to sell other wars. This one is on a whole different level. I mean, when did you ever see the head of a country, a warring country, the president of a foreign country, come twice to address a joint session of Congress? He got 18 standing ovations. Of course, Netanyahu got more, but... <laughs> um, 
He has been on the cover of Vogue. He has been the pr uh, person of the year of Time magazine. He addressed the Oscars. He addressed the Grammys. He addressed the Cannes Film Festival. He's come to every Davos and uh, every important economic meeting addressing them. It is just amazing. The selling of Zelensky, the selling of this war. And this is what we're up against. Now, on the positive side, in the rest of the world, there is a lot of pressure to end this war. We're seeing that from the global south, where country after country are saying, we're not taking sides in this war, there's only one side for us, and that's the side of peace. You better sit down and come up with a solution, <clears throat> because you're hurting our people. You're hurting our people because of the price of energy. You're hurting our people because of the price of food. You're hurting our people because of the attention being taken away from the existential threat of the climate that is affecting people all over the world. And that's where we have to be putting our money. And you're hearing that from Europeans as well. Because when this war started, the U.S. and the NATO countries were all prepared with the sanctions against Russia. They thought they had it nailed. They thought when they put those sanctions into place, the Russian economy would just crumble. And guess what? It's been the opposite. The Russian economy has not crumbled because the price of oil has gone down recently, but it was way high and they made a lot of money from that. But the Europeans are paying the price of the cost of energy. The Europeans are saying that our dirty energy companies are war profiteers because they're selling the LNG and the oil to Europe at four or five times the price of what we are paying for it here. They're also saying that US weapons companies are the ones that are really the winners from this war. Not only are they the ones that are getting most of the, our taxpayer money that we're spending for this, but now the European countries are spending more on their military, and guess what? A lot of that is going to our weapons companies as well. So there's tremendous war profiteering going on, and there's growing anger. And in Europe, they're having demonstrations with tens of thousands of people on the street. It happened in East Germany, it's happened in the Czech Republic, it's happened in Italy, and it's happened in France, where they're coming out against the, the inflation, and they're connecting that to the issue of Ukraine. And so then here I come to what can we do? Because we're still at the point where we're not able to get large numbers of people out in the streets. One reason is because we have to do a better job educating, educating, educating. And that's why I wrote the book, and I'm so glad that many of you got a copy of it, and I hope others will, and get it for your friends and relatives and people who really need to read it. And we have an 18-minute video that you can see online. It's free. Please pass it around. We're showing it in college campuses all over the country. It's important to give people the facts about this. And we are, in small numbers, getting out in the streets in rallies. And I know you have ones here in your community that are happening in places all over the country, people going out to farmers markets, people sitting out with booths that say, come talk to me about Ukraine, let's just have a discussion. I was just in New York City yesterday on Saturday. We had a very lively demonstration with a lot of young people, which was great to see. And the chant that they kept chanting was, money for the poor, not for war, money for the poor, not for war. They understand that their future is at stake. And so what we need to do is just find more ways to educate, to organize, and to mobilize. And one thing that I'm very excited about is that we managed right up into the lead up into the holiday season this year to work with groups like the Fellowship of Reconciliation to call for a Christmas truce. And we were aiming to get 100 religious leaders to sign on for that call. We got over 1,500 religious leaders in about two weeks' time. It showed 
how much they felt it was their calling, it was their duty to come out and be on record calling for peace talks. And that brings us full circle to Martin Luther King, who said it was his moral obligation. And whether we're doing this from a faith-based perspective, from an environmental perspective, or simply from a perspective that we don't like seeing people killed. We've got to find ways to convince others and then ultimately convince the people who hold the purse strings in Congress and the people who really can initiate talks not only with Russia, but push the Ukrainians to the peace table, and that is the White House. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you for the work you're doing. Let's see what we can do together to show that we are a nation that isn't going towards spiritual death because we want to renew our spiritual faith in humankind by building a world without war. Thank you. that's going around. Did anybody see where it ended up? Has anybody not had a chance to sign? We really want to stay in touch with you. I don't think it's gone over to this side, so if we can... Who has it? Oh, yeah. If we can be passing it around, that'd be great. Thank you. Is this going? Yes. yes, so we're going for questions. If people could come up here because we're recording this, it would be helpful if we could get it into the mic. If you can't get to the mic, just raise your hand and we'll repeat the question. My question is, is very general, and I'm just curious about your opinion. Aside from the grotesque greed and the uh, corruption in Washington and the government, which has been rampant for many years and has gotten worse in recent years, uh, how much do you think this, this and aside from the, 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 the demand by the Lydiacons anyway, that, the, that America may maintain hegemony, essentially, in the world, uh, how much do you think it's because, with the rise of China especially, uh, the American economy has been sort of deindustrialized, and therefore all we have is military stuff and the military industrial complex? I've just always been curious about that. I mean, do, are we dependent now on a perennial war or one after another or not? Well, certainly we have a war economy, and I talked about the companies that profit from this war, but it's much larger than the companies uh, because uh, you know how smart these war manufacturers, these merchants of death, have the, as the Pope calls them, have done their manufacturing in just about every single congressional district, so it becomes an issue about jobs, and it's an issue of tremendous corruption because the lobby groups for those weapons industries are in the halls of Congress constantly, and they are giving money to the campaigns of the Congress people. And we know that people like the Secretary of Defense came to us directly from the Board of Raytheon. I mean, how much, how more, much more obvious can it be that this military, industrial, congressional, and I love the way uh, uh, Ray McGovern says it, Mickey Back. Uh, he adds the other um, elements of this complex that what uh, Dwight Eisenhower warned us about, how it's become so humongous, and yet, and yes, it is the industrial basis of this country. It's terrible. Of, yeah. It wasn't always so. It wasn't always so, not at all. And you also brought up the issue of U.S. wanting to maintain hegemony in China. And I think it is so important when we talk about this to bring China into the picture because, you know, when the U.S. was bogged down, as they say, in the Middle East and Obama was like, we got to pivot to Asia, we got to pivot to Asia, you know, they wanted to start setting their sights on China, but they were too involved in these wars in the Middle East. And now, 
involved in this war in Russia, but at the same time, NATO and the US in its own security documents talks about our greatest adversary is China, which is ridiculous. There is no reason for us to treat China as an enemy, but China, unlike the US, is not going around the world using its military might, it's going around the world using its economic might with its Belt and Road Initiative and creating infrastructure projects that uh, sometimes are bad projects that hurt the environment and can hurt people, and a lot of times are good projects. They're actually win-win situations that make them friends. And so what is happening right now is that the U.S., and I think it was part of NATO's raison d'etre from the U.S. perspective, is to keep Europe in the U.S. realm and to stop it from going close to the Asian side. And when they were getting the uh, energy from uh, uh, Russia, uh, the U.S. didn't like that. And I remember being in some of these hearings in Congress and hear people from Texas like Senator Ted Cruz who were saying, we can't let that pipeline go through, that Nord Stream pipeline. We gotta do something about that. And I kept thinking, well wait, you know, they have the right to have their own Nord Stream pipeline with the Russia if they want. And then, lo and behold, the Nord Stream pipeline has blown up. And we can't figure out who the heck might have blown that up. Uh, what about Modo? Who didn't want to see it built to the begin with? Who said they could blow it up? Who gained from blowing it up? In you any case, it's part of Biden. Biden, and Biden said it in a press conference, we're gonna get rid of it. It's part of bringing Europe back into the fold of the US, making Europe dependent economically even more on the United States. But what it's doing is pushing Russia and China closer together. Even though our mass media is usually saying, oh, the Chinese are criticizing the Russians and they don't like it. No, the Chinese don't want the war, I don't think. They, they want to see Russia continue this war, but they are certainly increasing their trade with Russia right now. So in some ways, um, this is backfiring, uh, not only against Europe, but against the United States as well. And what we're also seeing is so many countries fed up with the US imposing its economic sanctions on the rest of the world, whether it's Cuba, or whether it's Venezuela, or Syria, or Korea, and now Russia and imposing sanctions on China, that they are starting bilateral trade outside the US dollar, and there will be, probably in the lifetimes of the younger people here, um, a, a, a complete revamping of the economic system so that the Swiss system, which is dominated by the dollar in all financial transactions, will just be one of many ways to transfer funds. What is absolutely stunning to me is that the leaders in Washington are so stupid to think that they can gain favor and make friends with other countries around the world using our military stuff, whereas China hasn't killed you know, several million people since 2000 in this century, and, and they haven't well, that's right, and we uh, you might have heard of the uh, entity called the BRICS, the alliance that's uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Uh, it is a huge uh, part of the world population and a huge part of the global economy, and now there are many, many other countries that want to join the BRICS, and this is really uh, a reflection of the kind of blowback that the U.S. is getting from all of these wars, all of these uh, uh, sanctions that it imposes or it tries to impose uh, on the rest of the world. In, the word in, your, in your book, you talk a lot about the uh, background in the current Ukrainian military of uh, the far right and Nazis, to put it bluntly, I guess. Um, have you given any more thought to that? And have you, uh, why don't we hear about it in the press? Because it would seem if a lot of people here knew some of what you talked about in terms of the sections of the Ukrainian army actually actively being current uh, Nazi sympathizers and adherents of Hitler, and given that Ukraine seems to have had a very 
a reprehensible past in World War II of killing Jews, that there would be some opposition, but this isn't talked about. And some people here, I've mentioned what you said in the book, have just said, oh, that's a lie. And uh, Mr. Snyder, who's written a lot of histories of the Ukraine, also feels that isn't the major factor. So I just wonder what your comments would be on that aspect of things. Yeah, as we talk about in the book, uh, the uh, neo-Nazi groups like the political parties um, did very poorly in the last election. They did not have a lot of political sympathy with the general population, but they have played an outsized role uh, militarily because they had paramilitary groups that were armed, that went to the Donbass, that were fighting there, refused to step down, refused to comply with the Minsk Accords. Um, they were the ones that threatened uh, past presidents, including Zelensky, if they were going to actually go and meet with the leaders of the breakaway republics. And now they have been incorporated into the army. You know, it used to be that there was, um, some of you might remember Congressman John Conyers from the US, uh, and he was very active, um, a real icon in the civil rights movement. Uh, he passed a bill saying that no US money could go to the Assaf Battalion because of their uh, Nazi sympathies. And um, that bill was taken up more recently but now it doesn't mean anything because it's all one army. And you can't say, well, this can't go to this group because you, you couldn't tell in the battlefield. Um, but certainly, when you have war, uh, it is the most militant ones that actually uh, have even more power. And so I think um, it doesn't come into the narrative because it doesn't fit within the narrative that the U.S. Um, wants to put out there. Uh, it doesn't fit with the narrative of Zelensky being the greatest Democrat uh, we've ever seen uh, and that we have to fight this war for democracy. Uh, and those who try to talk about it are silenced. Um, but I think it is important to know that history. That's why we wrote about it. Uh, and it's an important element to discuss with people when we talk about uh, the issue in Ukraine not being as, quote, black and white as it's made out to be. Um, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate your views. I wish you good luck in the future. Um, I was, I'm very grateful uh, for your reference at the beginning of your uh, talk to Martin Luther King's speech at, held or given at Riverside Church and it really uh, focused on a part of Martin Luther King that few people knew much about. And I want to say to you that um, eight years ago, we moved from, my wife and I, we moved from Pennsylvania, Bethlehem, and there's a peace organization. And for the last, I don't know how many years, every time his birthday is like today, we take turns reading that speech. Mm, and so um, I have a question about Putin. Um, Angela Merkel, for, for some 16 years, she was in frequent conversation with Putin, and probably Putin met uh, more times with her than anyone else. And when they got together, they would uh, often argue whether they should conduct the conversation in Russian or German. Um, but my question, it seems to me that Angela Merkel's views on Putin have changed she began to see a darker side of the man. And in your talk tonight, you mentioned Putin only two or three times. Can you tell us a little bit, who is that man? What is your view? Uh, what is his goal? Has he changed? How big is his ego? What is it that we need to know about this man? Well, I wish we had Ray McGovern with us here tonight because he could give us a much, much more insightful view of Putin than I can. Uh, what I do know is that uh, when the Soviet Union broke apart and there was the uh, 
what uh, Naomi Klein calls the disaster capitalism that came in and the uh, tremendous privatization of government enterprises and the, uh, the, the plummeting of the uh, well-being of the Russian people, the plummeting of the life expectancy of the Russian people, Vladimir Putin came in and got rid of a lot of the corruption, improved the economy, improved people's standard of living, and has been extremely popular because of that. And I have friends in Russia that I talk to all the time, including just today, um, who think that Putin uh, has been a good leader. They, my friends, and uh, it doesn't reflect, I don't know, you know what the population thinks, um, think that this is a terrible mistake that he committed uh, and that he is now um, boxed himself into a corner. Now, there are others who disagree and think that he knows what he is doing. Um, I think that just like the U.S. has gotten terrible intelligence when it went into Iraq, when it went into Afghanistan, when it went into uh, Libya, wherever, uh, I think so is the case in Russia, where he got bad intelligence about what would happen uh, with the Russian invasion. And I think once he was inside Russia, he's now staked his reputation on this, which means he's not about to pull out and say, I made a mistake. That would be the end of him. It also, uh, I also think that it's not just Putin who uh, wants to make sure that Crimea stays in the hands of, of Russia. I think that's a widespread feeling among a lot of Russians. And uh, I was told that they feel towards Crimea the way we feel towards Alaska, that it belongs to us. Um, and that uh, Putin is doing the right thing by trying to make sure that stays in the hands of Russia and protecting the Russian speaking and the ethnic Russians in the Donbass. Now there is tremendous censorship in Russia just as there is tremendous censorship in Ukraine. And so it's hard to know what the Russian people are thinking and feeling. We do know that when people came out on the streets in Russia to protest, they've been arrested. Uh, they, we do know that when they called up 300,000 more reservists, hundreds of thousands of uh, young men of military age fled the country because they don't want to fight. We do know that there is an underground movement against the war in Russia. Um, uh, I think in the United States we personalize it so much to be about Putin, but I think when it comes to Putin and Russia, there is a much larger group of nationalists in Russia who do feel uh, that they have lost a lot of their prestige with the fall of the Soviet Union, that the U.S. has been trying to push them around, that they shouldn't allow the U.S. to push them around, they shouldn't allow the U.S. to expand NATO to the borders that it already is now. And so I think even with the censorship, it is a popular position inside Russia, that Russia is just trying to protect itself and that having a stronghold of NATO on the border of Ukraine is an existential threat to Russia whether that's because of Russian propaganda or because it's the way they really feel, I do think um, that, that we have to recognize that sentiment goes way beyond food. So maybe we have time for one other comment or question. About Putin, I just read this book called Russia Upside Down by somebody who's been a scholar of Russia his whole life. Can you get a little closer? Oh, yeah, he's been a scholar of Russia his whole life. He said uh, that Putin's uh, approval rating is 80%. Well, so it was uh, that before the war began, but it's gone down now to about 67%, which is still that's incredibly a whole lot high. More than the presidents around here get. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Last, so, do we have any last uh, comment, suggestion? Yes. Yeah. War has a mind. War has a mind of its own. Once it gets started. There's no stopping it. The fly rule is going so heavy. That's the military-industrial complex. And the money. 
when you follow the money goes to the weapons. If you think about that, everything, all these decisions that are being made benefits the war machine. So. Well, that, that's right. And when you say, you know, war has a cycle of its own and it starts and then, you know, you hate your opponent more because they killed your uh, comrade or your son or, you know, and that hate just keeps spinning and spinning and spinning. Absolutely. But, you know, that's why when you're uh, especially now at war with uh, nuclear power, if we go back to Martin Luther King, um, it's either uh, nonviolence or um, non-existence. Yeah. Uh, well, along with, along with our conversations here and, and the material that's on the table uh, back there, I'd like, to, I'd like to just read a brief bit here that came from Robert Jensen, a journalist uh, from the University of Texas who stood up against his critics when he criticized the attack on Iraq. Um, uh, it's called a citizen's oath of office. Have y'all heard of this? <laughs> okay. It says, I do solemnly pledge, and I feel like this is in keeping with Medea's charge to us to act. I do solemnly pledge that I will faithfully execute the office of citizen of the United States. And that I will, to the best of my ability, resist corporate control of the world, resist militarism, resist the rollback of civil rights, and resist illegitimate authority in all its forms. <laughs> so there's some copies of this. There's some copies of this on the back, and, and I, I ran across a demonstration in Brevard. And I asked them, look at this, do you think the folks here would like to hear it? And, uh, and like, you know, 50 or 80 people were sworn in that day. <laughs> Great. And Jerry, are there things that you want to tell people they can do, get involved in? Ah, well, supporting independent media is something that uh, has been our theme here. Because the corporate... <laughs> The corporate media, I mean, they have their priorities and, and we're not it. And so uh, we're, it, it, it's, there is a, the, let's see, it's the University of Adelaide in Australia that did a study as to the, the massive influence peddling that's going on through social media and found that to the U.S. pro-war, essentially, just to make it brief, uh, effort, has been intense worldwide. Uh, and we, we see it at different times and we're certainly seeing it now. So um, there's just a proliferation of programs, a proliferation of, of interview series on YouTube. Some of them have been pulled from YouTube and they have to go to Mint Press or other, other media. Uh, so just follow the folks you find consistent in their in their efforts, and we have a lot of allies. So, and it's great to be here among <laughs> this crowd of allies tonight. So, thank you all. Uh, applaud yourselves, and let's give Medea another big hand. <laughs> I understand that there's a very pink uh, weekly program that uh, WCOM, our best. North Carolina Public Radio Station, a little tiny station in Carborough, uh, is considering pairing it. So, so check check the uh, schedule. What's that? Uh, 103.5, and it's online. Check it out. Uh, WCOM FM, and that's how we get it out in Chatham County. Yeah, and the books are available if anybody missed. Yeah, yeah, Medea will be out there uh, and with the books and signing.